Good evening. Thank, good evening. Thanks for your talk. Um, do you really believe that 100% or roughly most all human beings have the capacity to lose faith? Along the lines of most, there are plenty of human beings who can't add one and one to two. I mean, lots of them can, but really, what percentage of people do you think have the capacity to really question their faith and move toward move away from faith? I can't say how many. I mean, I I just feel that there's a, an awful lot more could than do, uh, and that's enough for me. That's enough to inspire me to have a go. Um, I, don't, I, I don't want to claim that everybody would. I mean, um, I saw yesterday uh, or the day before a, a film of a woman on YouTube who was holding forth, I think she's some kind of an actress, and she wanted to say, do dogs have brains? And um, her argument was, well, they can't talk. Um, so, um, and then she said, um, well, I guess they can walk, but, but only because we tell them how to. Um, and then she said, well, I guess, God's a, I, I guess, I guess dogs are uh, God's creatures. I love you, Jesus. Uh, I, th th there are people like that who are... Who <laughs> they have the vote. Okay. But, but, I, but I do think that an awful lot, lot more, more people are... are um, convertible, including, by the way, a large number of members of Congress. It, it cannot be true. There are 535 members of the U.S. Congress. It simply cannot be true that every one of them, possibly with one exception, it cannot be true that every one of them has a religious faith. That has that statistical nonsense. A, a substantial number of them are lying, and they're lying because they know they have to lie, or they think they have to lie in order to get, to get elected by people like this woman who thought dogs were, didn't have brains. Um, <laughs> but I actually, the, the number of people in the United States, polls suggest the number of people who lack religious faith is now about 22%. That's a very substantial number. And it's time politicians realize that. Okay, uh, next question, please. And again, I just want to state that just please ask your question. Um, when religious people stand on the book of their religion and atheists can stand on science as their platform, how do you bring people from religion and their book to the scientific platform and, and have them understand that view rather than always arguing their point by giving you scripture? I think the question is, um, would it be a better way to just promote science uh, rather than be negative? Is that, is that the point? Well, how, do you, how do you promote science to those who may not be Yes. Well, s science is wonderful. I mean, I think one, one of the problems with promoting science is that many people promote it as useful, uh, which, of course, it is, and, and you can't d d deny that. That's extremely important. But it, it's also w wonderful, and... It's sort of the Carl Sagan approach to promoting science, as opposed to what I call the non-stick frying pan approach. Um, the, the space enterprise um, could be sold by the fact that a byproduct of it was the development of non-stick frying pans, but that's not a good reason for going into space. Um, a good reason for going into space is something more poetic than that. It's, the, it's more the, the, the Carl Sagan. The usefulness of science is, 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 is part of it, but inspire people with the poetry of science. Science is the poetry of reality. And I think another problem with, with teaching science is that, is that it's often taught as if you can't do science unless you actually are going to, be, are going to practice it in the lab. This is the Bunsen burner school of, of, um, of, of science teaching. Um, yes, it's important that we have young scientists who learn how to use the Bunsen burner and all the other apparatus of science. But just as you can appreciate music without playing an instrument, you don't actually have to do five-finger exercises on the piano. You don't have to actually play the violin or something in order to appreciate and enjoy music and even be expert in, in, in music. So science can be taught in a, in a non-practical way. Okay. Uh, question, please. 
Thank you for your talk. Uh, there's quite a few of my fellow students here tonight from Lewis and Clark Law School uh, that are part of the Secular Legal Society. Uh, is, in your experience working with other people, what, what can we do as future lawyers to help the secular movement? Well, um, you could be honest. Um, <laughs> As all, as all the best lawyers are, there are some, some of my best friends are lawyers. <laughs> um, you, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are major things you could do. Um, you, could, um, you could fight for the, uh, you could fight against the tax exemption, the automatic tax exemption of religious organizations. <laughs> which, which is... Which is, which is a scandal in both Britain and America. Um, it's, it's true that, if, certainly in, in Britain, if you want to get charitable status for your, that, that means tax-exempt status for your, for your charity, all you have to do is be, is be religious, be a, be a church of some sort, and it, you go through like a breeze, not a problem. I set up a foundation, and it took me two years to get, to get it given um, charitable tax-exempt status, for promoting reason and science. And I got a letter from the British Charity Commission, which is the body that, de that decides this. And the letter said, please inform us how science benefits humanity. <laughs> in, in, America, in America, you get tax-exempt status simply if you call yourself reverend. May I invite everybody in this room <laughs> to define themselves as a reverend and apply for tax-exempt status. And everybody in the country should do it and kill this once and for all. It's an absolute nonsense that this happens. Next question, where are we? Where are we? Who has the mic? Could you stand up, please? Yes. Thank you. So I, I was wondering, um, the DSM makes an exemption for religious you know, visualizations as not being halluc hallucinations. And so, you know, psychology is a field that's steeped in science. I'm wondering how can we rid psychology of that sort of cancerous ideology? I didn't quite understand. Did you use an abbreviation? For the DSM, the Diagnostic... What's DSM? Diagnostic Statistics Manual. It's, it's what the psychologists use to make diagnoses for, for, I Ill, for I mental illness. I, I don't know about that, obviously, um, or I would have, wouldn't have queried it. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so this is, this is a diagnostic test for, for what? It's a, it's a manual. It's, it's what, what psychologists use. It's, I'll, I'll give you, uh, may I answer this question? Yes, please do, yeah, yeah. Ch <laughs> chapter 9 of my book, it's right there, a manual for creating atheists. We must remove the uh, exemption for, for uh, if, if somebody is suffering from a delusion and they happen to share that with other people and they put this moniker or this tag on it called religion, they're granted an exception. And so in my book, I detail exactly how we can, that's the number one thing that oh, we right. can do to yes. help to fight the faith virus. Next uh, question. Could you please stand up? Um, you talk about promoting science versus denigrating religion, uh, which I understand is probably a more useful tact. Um, but given religious, um, religion's moral transgressions, um, shouldn't we be taking a stronger arm against religious activities um, versus more, so science is good, um, pointing out, wouldn't it be more beneficial to point out how religion is, is bad, is hurtful? I suppose you should take a strong stand where religion actively interferes with other people's lives. Um, prob you, probably shouldn't inter you probably shouldn't go in and interfere with people's right to be religious. Um, but I should have thought you'd be right to go in and to stop people interfering in other people's lives. Um, so if uh, a religion, well, the, the example of the Florida school that I, that I told you about, where a religious parent actually interfered in the education of other children, um, that's something we should fight intensely. Um, I would like to see um, more consciousness of the rights of children not to be um, indoctrinated, not to be uh, manipulated um, just because their parents happen to belong to a certain religion. I, I 
I, do, I don't think I want to have sort of police swooping in to, you know, seize children and take them away from their parents. Um, but I do think it would be nice if we all had our consciousness raised about, and the consciousness raising is a feminist slogan, which, I, which is very, I mean, the, the feminists did brilliant consciousness raising. Um, so that without anything dictatorial, they, they made us realize when we use sexist language, for example. We should realize when we use religionist language, when we, um, for example, label children with the religion of their parents. It should be not a criminal offense to call a, a four-year-old child a Catholic child, but it should be something that makes everybody wince when they hear. And a, very, and a very easy way to do that consciousness raising is to, to talk to people about an existentialist child or a logical positivist child <laughs> or a postmodernist child. Nobody would ever dream of doing that. And yet we all of us quite happily listen to people talking about, oh, it's a Catholic child, Muslim child. There is no such thing as a Catholic child or a Muslim child. There is a child of Catholic parents and a child of Muslim parents. It's consciousness raising, not dictatorial swooping in and, 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 le and making illegal. You shouldn't make it illegal to talk about a Catholic child. You just make people ashamed to talk about a Catholic child. Next question, please. Hey, um, earlier you mentioned something about um, like evolution being obviously the correct thing, and there was some laughter, and you asked why, and we said America. Um, and it's kind of well known that, uh, in a way, we're the laughing stock of the rest of the civilized world as far as um, being behind and saying, you know, evolution is science, period. Um, so what, what's your question? Sorry. I apologize. Um, so I guess what, I, what I'm wondering is how um, do you think that this impacts us as a country and do you think there's, um, do you see it improving in the near future? This country is beyond any doubt the leading scientific nation in the world. And you have achieved this, I congratulate you, you've achieved this despite being held back by nearly 50%, more than 40% of the population who, uh, according to Gallup polls, believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. Uh, this is symptomatic of an astonishing um, poverty of scientific education. Um, and as I say, it, in spite of that, this country is by far the leading scientific nation in the world. Some of you may have heard me say before that to believe that the world is only 10,000 years old is equivalent to believing that the width of North America is eight yards. Good, good. Okay. Uh, That's what you get if you calculate it out. <laughs> uh, where's the mic? Who has the mic? Okay, yes, sir. Yes, um, um, Richard, what are your thoughts about the Sunday Assembly? About what? The Sunday, the Sunday assembly. assembly. Okay, I think was the, this, this started in Britain, I think, didn't it? Um, and it was an idea to take over churches or at least the assembly halls and have non-religious Sunday services where you don't do prayers but you do things like lectures and um, I don't know what you else you do singing. Do you sing secular hymns? Or, or, um, <laughs> um, I think that might be a bit grisly, actually, a bit embarrassing, sing, singing secular hymns. Um, but I, I, but the, the idea of having seminars, discussions, um, lectures about interesting subjects, that, that seems to me to be a good thing to do, um, to, to do it while a diminishing, a dwindling number of people are going to church. Um, they really are dwindling in Britain except to mosques, unfortunately. Mm. Plenty of people do that. Yeah, almost anything would be a better use for a church than a mosque than to have a service in there. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, uh, next question. Where, where is the mic? In the, in the back. Yes, sir. 
So aside from the hypersensitivity to Islam, uh, leftists and liberals have another problem that's particularly bad in this city, um, and that's this obsession with alternative medicine and homeopathy and <laughs> mysticism and other baseless beliefs. Uh, how do we talk to these people? Well, um, yes, I mean, alternative medicine um, needs to be evaluated by the same criteria as medicine does. Um, the same double-blind control trials need to be done to evaluate homeopathy, acupuncture, laying on of hands, whatever it is. Um, and if they pass the test with flying colors, they will cease to be alternative. Right. They will simply become medicine. Um, I mean, there's a very good herbal remedy which comes from bark of some tree. Um, we call it aspirin. Uh, and um, it works. And uh, that, that, that has moved from being herbal medicine to being, to being medicine. Um, if double-blind trials show that homeopathy worked, that would become medicine. That's difficult, mind you, because uh, kind of by definition, it's very hard to imagine that happening since the, the dose is pure water and the experimental is pure water. Uh, um, it's hard to imagine that a double-blind trial ever could produce a result. They, they do have a get out there. They say, well, um, although there's not a trace left of the active molecule in the water. By the way, James Randi has a lovely calculation. Um, because, you know, they dilute and dilute and dilute and dilute. Um, and, and they have this belief that the more you dilute, the better it gets. Um, and James Randi calculated that for some of the most allegedly effective homeopathic remedies, um, there is one molecule of the active substance in a volume of water equal to the volume of the solar system. <laughs> well, um, the get out is that they say, well, it doesn't matter that there are no molecules there because water has a memory. And by shaking the water up originally with a, with a reasonable quantity of molecules and then diluting it, every time you shake it, you sort of potentize the, the memory of the water. Um, now, if that were true, the discoverer of it, the homeopath who discovered it, would win not only the Nobel Prize for medicine, but the Nobel Prize for physics. Because <laughs> this would be a brand new um, physical principle which physicists are utterly ignorant about at present. It would be a fabulous discovery. <laughs> because of this, homeopaths all over the world are beavering away, doing double-blind trials to try to win the Nobel Prize for physics. Like hell they are. <laughs> All right, we, we're, we're going down to the end. I think we have time uh, for a couple more, couple more questions. Where's the mic? Who has the mic? The mic. Yes, sir, in the back. Hey, um, I had a quick question. Um, in all of your travels, um, have you ever met someone that you ran, like you, you ran into them and you thought, wow, they're so mentally unstable, they're so criminally insane that they need religion just to not go around killing people? <laughs> I have met, um, I, 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 I was once on a, a, a radio talk show, quite often I'm actually, and, and I get these rather interesting um, call-ins. I got one from Texas and he said, um, I won't try and do the accent, he said, um, if I didn't believe in God, I would go straight out and murder my neighbor. And I said, I don't think, no, surely you wouldn't. And he said, yes, I would. Um, and um, I think it's Herb Silverman, when he meets somebody who says something like that, he says, um, well, I don't think I want to know you anymore. Um, if, the, if the only thing that's stopping you, killing, stealing, raping, is your belief in in, in that, that, that God will, will, will punish you. You're just not the kind of person I want to know. Um, but, and I, I think perhaps that's the nearest I can get to answering your question. All right, where's the mic? Where are we with the mic? Yes, young lady. Yeah, thank you for coming, um, Mr. Doggins. I appreciate your, your existence. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I do. Um, I'm asking uh, the big question of what's your hope? What do you see 
as being our hope for the future so that we can hang on to some while we're having these arguments. Don't, don't, don't our students ask great questions? Portland yeah. State, right on. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I suppose I hope for a world which is, um, in, in which everybody is, is rational and believes things only when there is evidence in favor of them and does not believe things because of tradition, authority, uh, scripture, revelation, but only because of evidence. And quite a lot of people are already in that position and they're increasing and I think I want to live in a world where everybody is like that. It's more of a, a hope than, a, than an expectation at present, but I think, it's, I think things are moving in the right direction and let's all try and make it happen. Excellent. Last one. We have time for one, one more. Yes, sir. Thank you. As someone who reasons so strongly, I'm curious, why do you feel so strongly or seem to feel so strongly about Wilson's turn on inclusive fitness? Oh, gosh. Do you want that at the very last? The I, I was just going to, the moment he said that, I, I said, wow, I was saying, wow, we have time for one more after that. Uh, do, do you... I mean, I, I can do it, but, but it, it, it takes 10 minutes. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's sensible to try to, um, to um, th this is a fairly esoteric biological question, which I'm very interested in. Um, uh, well, it's, it's up to you. Do you, do you want him to do it? Okay. Okay. Um, the theory of inclusive fitness is due to W.D. Hamilton in 1964, and he argued that uh, because genes are shared by collateral kin as well as by lineal kin, cousins and siblings and nephews and nieces, as well as by children and grandchildren, any gene which causes an individual to behave altruistically towards any relative has a chance of being passed on because it is shared, statistically speaking, by that relative, provided that the benefits and costs are uh, favorable. Uh, uh, specifically, RB has to be greater than C, where R is the coefficient of relatedness, which is an index of the, of the number of genes shared. B is the benefit to the beneficiary of the altruism, and C is the cost to the, to the altruist. Now, this principle that Hamilton discovered is actually inherent in the neo-Darwinian synthesis. It follows logically, mathematically, inevitably, from the neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 1930s, which all modern biologists accept. You cannot disagree, you cannot say, I don't believe in inclusive fitness, unless you disbelieve in evolution altogether. If you're an evolutionist at all, which Wilson is, Ed, this is Edward Wilson, E.O. Wilson, one of the most distinguished living biologists. Um, Wilson is a Darwinian, he, he accepts the, the, the modern synthesis, but he, he now wants to uh, reject his earlier acceptance of inclusive fitness because he doesn't see direct evidence for it in the animals which um, were the sort of poster boys for inclusive fitness, namely the social insects. The, I, th I think he's wrong about, about the social insects, but even if he's right, all that would mean is that the B and C terms of the formula don't favor um, altruism in the, in the way that, um, that the kin selection, the inclusive fitness theory would, would, uh, would expect. To attempt to disprove it, the inclusive fitness theory as opposed to the ordinary Darwinian theory, the classical fitness theory, by looking at real animals would be equivalent to Pythagoras going out with a ruler and measuring hundreds of right angle triangles to see whether Pythagoras' theorem is correct. Pythagoras' theorem is correct because it is logically proved. You cannot escape Pythagoras' theorem. Um, it's, it's, it's proved once and for all time. All right-angled triangles in a plane surface um, obey Pythagoras' theorem. All animals and plants obey the, the, the law of inclusive fitness. 
they don't all show altruism towards their siblings or nephews and nieces because the B and C terms in the equation don't favor it. But the R term, that's the index of, re of relatedness, is always there tending to push them in the direction of altruism towards siblings and cousins, etc. But it only actually shows itself if the B's and C, if the B and C terms of the equation, which are economic parameters of the ecology of the animal concerned, they have to be favorable as well. So um, Wilson and um, his colleague no Novak and, and another colleague um, wrote a paper, it was published in Nature, uh, which, um, in which Wilson sort of took back his earlier enthusiastic acceptance of inclusive fitness. Um, this paper, I mean, I don't like talking in terms of, of numbers of scientists. We don't do science democratically, but nevertheless, it's worth mentioning that, that more than, I think more than 100 reputable biologists in the field signed a joint paper um, dissenting from the Wilson view. He's on his own. He's a great man, but he's on his own. And um, I, I, it seems to me that he, quite apart from the number against him, he's got to be on his own because, as I said, it is a logical deduction from the neo-Darwinian synthesis of Fisher, Haldane, Wright, and the other founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which Wilson accepts. Nothing more to say. Uh, I... I I would, like to, uh, I would like to thank you so much, so, so much for coming and speaking with us and sharing your evening with us. We profoundly appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Dawkins. <laughs>